Brooklyn, you did well. That's one of my favorites. Hadn't heard it in a long time. That text that she's uh, that that was written about is where the water was moved. An angel would come down at a certain time, move the water. You might know that scholarship assaults that and says that it's not in the oldest text. Some of the oldest original manuscripts, which they do not have. Let me mind you, nobody has an original manuscript. And so what you need to do is to put yourself and to take some heavy-duty manuscript evidence and do some serious studying before you jerk whole passages out of the Bible. Amen. That's in there. It belongs in there, and God has blessed it. Yeah. Wilt thou be made whole? Amen. That's good. Turn to the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 this morning. Ezekiel chapter number 28, I'll preach the message of entitled Satan. Just one word, Satan. Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse number 14. Ezekiel chapter number 28 and verse 14. The scripture says, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. And I have set thee so, thou wast upon the holy mountain of God. And thou hast walked up and down in the midst of the stones of fire. Thou wast perfect in thy ways from the day that thou wast created till iniquity was found in thee. By the multitude of thy merchandise, they have filled the midst of thee with violence. Thou hast sinned, therefore I will cast thee as profane out of the mountain of God. And will destroy thee, O covering cherub, from the midst of the stones of fire. Father, bless your word now. Bless it as it goes forth for the purpose you intend it. In thy name I pray, amen. And here again, the scripture that I just read to you, many of the so-called Bible scholars say it had nothing to do with Satan. It's addressing an earthly king. I personally believe in verse number 13, it says, Thou hast been in Eden the garden of God. There's no doubt in my mind that we're talking about that anointed cherub that the apostle Peter said, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, lest your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. The word of God has a lot to say about the spirit world. And we need to understand today that the spirit world is not the physical world. There is the natural man, there is the carnal man, and there is the physical man. I'm standing before you this morning, body, soul, and spirit. The reason I have tripart nature is because I am in the image of God. And only a man is in the image of God. There's far more to me than simply the body that's standing before you this morning. Satan is a spirit being. The Bible calls him the anointed cherub that covereth. The word anointed in Hebrew is Mashiach. The word anointed in Greek is Christos. They are the anointed ones. A special touch and blessing and an outpouring and gift from God. Satan therefore was set apart from his creation for his purpose in glorifying and praising God. The Bible tells us plainly that he is a Messiah. He is Mashiach. And because of this, he can be a counterfeit to the true Messiah. In 2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 4, the Apostle Paul warns them. He tells them this in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 4. He said plainly in the text, let me get to it here, now here we are. He says, If he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive another spirit, and which ye have not received, or another gospel, which we have not preached, my friend, even 2,000 years ago, when Lord Jesus Christ was here, his counterpart, his enemy, the fake, the false, these were there also at the same time. I don't know of a stronger weapon that Satan has against the truth than to present himself as Christ himself. This is a lie straight out of the pit. And who are you listening to today? What Christ are, is being preached in the churches in this country or throughout the world? It's important. For the Bible lays the burden upon me that I watch for your souls as one that must give an account. And I don't take that lightly. So therefore it is incumbent upon me to preach Christ and him crucified. In the book of Ezekiel chapter number 1 and verse number 10, we have some remarkable statements about this anointed cherub. In Ezekiel chapter number 1 
and verse number 10, here's what it says. And as for the likeness of their faces, they forehead the face of a man, the face of a lion. On the right side, they forehead the face of an ox. On the left side, and also the face of an eagle. So my friend, let, I want you to compare something with me. Took a look at the book of Ezekiel chapter number 10. Ezekiel chapter 10 and verse number 14. Do a little Bible study here while we're doing this. Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 14. Everyone, referring back to these same creatures, these are cherubim, referring back to them, Ezekiel chapter 10 verse 14, everyone had four faces. The first face was the face of a cherub. The second face was the face of a man. The third face, the face of a lion. And the fourth, the face of an eagle. What's missing here? What changed? This is how you find out what changed. What changed between chapter number one and verse 10 and chapter 10 and verse 14? We've got the face of a lion. We've got the face of an eagle. We've got the face of a man. But the Bible says in chapter number one, we have the face of an ox. Then in chapter number 10, it's the face of a cherub. So here we have the face of a cherub is the face of an ox. Have you heard about Apis, the bull of Egypt? You've heard about that. You've heard about the sacred cow that wa wanders through the streets of Calcutta and places like that. So we have, we have a connection here with a bovine, with a cattle. And we won't get into a, a lot of this, but he said in the book of Genesis, thou art cursed above all cattle in reference to this. So we, now, we know that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four gospels, each one of them have their unique perspective of our Lord Jesus Christ. Matthew's the king, Mark's the servant, Luke's the man. And then we have John, the gospel, the gospel of John. Matthew has a genealogy, Luke has a genealogy, uh, uh, Mark and John do not. But Matthew's genealogy has to do with a king. Mark's gene Mark has no genealogy, nor would a servant have a genealogy. But then the book of Luke has the genealogy of the man, tracing him all the way back to Adam. And then the gospel of John has no genealogy, unless you could say, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. Now that's a good genealogy, don't you think? Amen. But what we have here in Matthew is the, is the, is the king. So what animal would you call the king of the jungle? He's called, oh, that's exactly right, the lion. Then we have Mark, the servant. What animal would you call the servant? Of course it's the ox. And then we have the book of Luke, the man. See, the man. And the genealogy in Luke goes back to the man. Then the gospel of John, the genealogy. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God. And what? The word was God. The genealogy of almighty God himself as he became a man. So here are the four genealogies and the four, and the four uh, perspectives upon this cherubim. Is he a creature that we can respect? You better believe it. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 14. I call your attention to this. 2 Corinthians chapter number 14 and verse number 15. Here's what it says. 11, chapter 11 and verse number 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works. We had best be on the guard, shouldn't we? We should be able to try the spirits. We ought to know who's standing before us, who has a Bible opened, and who's purporting to be preaching the word of God. We better check them out, amen. And you're not, do, you know, you're not being mean. What you're doing is obeying scripture. Try the spirits to see if they be of the Lord. So we, need here, we read here that it's cherub. He's, he's a cherub. Satan is. Now I, can't, I don't have time to get into all that a cherub is. There's an awful lot involved with it. But the second thing I want to call your attention to is this. Satan is also included among the beast. In the book of Genesis chapter number 3. Genesis chapter number 3 and verse number 1. We read these words in Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said of the woman, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. The word translated serpent here is nachash. This is the same word associated with nehushtan, the fiery serpents out there in the wilderness that were biting the people. This, my friend, is a special type of serpent. He was upright walking about among men. The curse put him crawling on his belly. Even in the millennium, he'll still be crawling. So a beast is associated with Satan himself. 
2 Corinthians chapter number 11 and verse number 3, we read these words in 2 Corinthians 11 and verse number 3. Here's what the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 11, 3. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. How many have ever heard of cryptid uh, creatures or cryptozoology? You ever heard of that? Did a little, done a little reading into it? You'll find out that it's quite an involved thing. You'll find out that it in itself is a, is a some say a pseudoscience. I wouldn't call it that. Uh, here's the way they work. Anything they don't like, they put pseudo in front of it. And pseudos is a Greek word for false, you know, like a like a, anything that is false, science puts pseudo on it. And when they do that, they demonize it. And if you part of it, if you believe in it, if you trust it, then you're a fool. This is the way this operates. But in any event, this is what's called cryptozoology. Uh, sightings of things that just don't fit in the books that you can't teach you about in the library. But don't you look at the book of Job, chapter number 40 and verse number 15. You see, the Bible doesn't pull punches. The Bible comes out plainly and mentions creatures. In the book of Job, chapter 40 and verse number 15, Behold now, behemoth, which I made with thee, he eateth grass as an ox. You read what the scholars have to say, and some say it's an owl crocodile. Some call it a hippopotamus. This, that, this, that. Instead of simply accepting it for what the Bible says it is, what is it? The Bible's not real clear on it, but it's a creature, and it's a creature you don't see every day. Notice the second chapter, the next chapter, chapter number 41 of the book of Job. Verse number one, chapter 41, verse one. Canst thou draw out Leviathan with an hook or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? And then what follows is a description of Leviathan. Behemoth and Leviathan are both connected with the devil. How do you know that? Look at the book of Isaiah, chapter number 27. And verse number one. In that day the Lord with his sore and great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing servant, serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent, and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. I'm a Bible believer, folks. I don't make excuses for the Bible. I simply preach what it says. Sometimes I understand what's going on. Sometimes I don't, but I'm still going to preach it. Whether I understand all that I've got in my hand, just like the Old Testament prophets that Peter told us about. He said they prophesied of things to come, yet they did not fully understand what the prophecy was and how it related. That's fine. We don't have to know. But look what it says in the book of Revelation, chapter number uh, 13. Revelation chapter number 13 and verse number 1, as it relates to Leviathan. Look how the Bible begins to define itself. In Revelation chapter number 13 and verse 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea, and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. This is behemoth. He's a composite creature. There's more to him than simply one. Now go back to chapter number 12 and verse number 17. Revelation 12, 17. And the dragon was wroth with a woman, and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God, and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Well, who is this preacher? Go back to verse number seven, Revelation chapter number 12. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. Is Michael real? Oh, yes, he is. He is very real. So is this dragon real? Yes, it is. You see, under certain circumstances and places, according to Almighty God, Satan has to reveal himself as an animal connected with the animal world. And what we have here in Revelation chapter number 13 is war between Michael and Archangel, the one who stands for Israel, according to Daniel chapter number 12, and Satan, who here is called a great red dragon. In the book of Job, he's called Leviathan. So here we are. We have creatures that our eyes have not seen, but they exist. Make no mistake about that whatsoever. Keep it in mind. Revelation chapter number 16 and verse number 13 says this. Revelation 16 verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. 
See the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet? See the satanic trinity? See them as they send forth spirits? These spirits, look at verse number 13. I saw spirits. What happens when you see a spirit? A spirit in its essence is an invisible thing. But when you begin to see it, then we have something else that's happening now, don't we? Look what it says in the book of Revelation chapter number 6 and verse number 9. Revelation 6, 9. We are seeing spirit beings. Revelation 6 and verse number 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Well, the soul is a spiritual entity. Now, I didn't say it's your spirit, but it is a spiritual entity. It is an invisible part of your being. And so the Bible tells us now that they can see this. I grew up in a home with my grandmother and my grandfather. My grandfather was born in 1878. So that gives you an idea of how far back that culture goes that I grew up in. I heard my grandmother and grandfather more than one time talk about haints. How many's ever heard that word? Amen. All right. Did they believe in haints? Oh yes, they did. Their, their, their generation did. They certainly did. They certainly did. They believed in haints. Are you so not a preacher? Are you telling me that, uh, that people come back? As, no, I didn't say anything about people coming back as ghosts. But what I did tell you is that there's a spirit world out there. And I did tell you this. I'll tell you this this morning. That spirit world has in it what's called demons, diamonion. Demon, a spirit being. And these spirit beings can appear as all forms, all kinds of things. And I believe you're seeing a lot of that going on right now. I believe you're going to see more go on. Yes, I do. Second Kings chapter number 6 and verse number 17. You know this story well. If you've been reading your Bible, you know the story of the prophet Elisha. And you know his servant, they were in the field. And you know the enemy came upon them. And when the enemy came upon them, the servant was, well, essentially, he was scared to death. He said, what in the world are we going to do? And so Elisha, in verse number 17, prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw and behold, the mountains were full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. What carried Elijah up into the presence of God? A chariot of fire. You say there are no horses in heaven. Listen, folks, God can make a supernatural horse appear and disappear in a moment of time. Make no mistake about that. He can do that. <laughs> That's nothing for God. But anyway, what you have, and I want to call your attention to this, is an unseen world that on occasion we are allowed to look into. Now you might want to get on YouTube and look at some of these uh, nurses. Uh, what do they call them? The, when, the, when somebody goes to the, the, the hospice. Thank you. Thank you. Hospice nurses. You might want to go on there and read some of the testimonies that they give. And maybe talk to some doctors. Listen to what some of the doctors say. And people that deal in the medical profession that are around people that are passing from this earth. And you might be surprised at some of the stories that they have to tell. Now, some folks just pass this off and say, well, you know, that's just, they're, they're, they're hallucinating this and that and this and that. My dear friend, my, my aunt died in Chicago, Illinois. And I've told you this before, but a lot of you are new and you've never heard this before. I told you I lived with my grandfather. This was his daughter that lived in Chicago. I was about 10 years old, 1956. I remember my grandfather coming into the house that night and he, and he woke up and, he was, and he, was, he was visibly moved. And he said to us, I just saw Grace in the middle of the street out in front of the house. Now that was my aunt's name, Grace. And she lived in Chicago, Illinois. He said, I just saw her. She was walking in the street right in front of the house. Now folks, I'm standing before God. Either I'm telling you the truth or I'm not. And I'm telling you the truth. And he said, I saw her and it visibly shaken. And it wasn't that long after that until word came that Grace had passed that night and gone on out of this world. Now, how do you explain that? How do you explain that? What, what did he see, preacher? He saw a vision. He saw, he saw into the spirit world. And God allowed him to see something. And when he did, this old boy right here, believed, listen, this is a Baptist preacher that believes the spirit world's real. 
I'm not preaching to you with a white coat on in a laboratory and we're up here telling everybody what to wear, when to wear, where to sit, what to say, you know, and, and treat you like an, a bunch of automatons. When you come in here, you're a person. You're a human being. You're somebody that has a soul, a spirit, and you can believe or not believe on your own what I'm trying to say to you this morning. Oh yes, I'll never forget that. My gra and now here's something too for, the, for you atheists and agnostics. God bless your soul. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Not mad at you. <laughs> How do you explain that? <laughs> How do you, you see, the atheist and the agnostic, he runs as hard as he can when it comes down to a world that doesn't fit under a microscope or in his textbook or that can be explained. He has no explanation for it. And I'm going to tell you why you don't. Because we don't know everything. But I know what happened to me in 1973. Amen. God saved my soul and wrote my name, the Lamb's Book of Life. So he's a cherub. He's part of the beast. He's an unseen being. And then we read in the, book of, uh, in the book of Job chapter number one and verses six through seven, the Lord said, Satan, where have you been? And Satan said, I've been going to and fro. I've been going to and fro on the earth, to and fro. And he said, hadst thou considered my servant Job? Well, now look what Peter said about the same thing. First Peter chapter number five. And verse number eight, first Peter five, eight, we read these words. Now, what is a good, let me give this tonight, hopefully, as a way to help you study the Bible. When the Old Testament says something and it's quoted in the New Testament, watch how they use it. Watch how the one who quotes the Old Testament makes an application of that text. Now, a scripture can be quoted from the Old Testament and used in a lot of different ways, but that's one of the ways to learn the Bible comparing scripture with scripture. And folks, you'll be amazed at how your Bible will come alive. In the book of 1 Peter chapter number five and verse number eight, we read these words. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. Did you see that? Satan is constantly on the move, constantly seeking someone. Is he on your trail today? Has he been bothering you? Has he been coming against you? He'll look for a weakness. He'll look for a door. He'll look for an avenue. He'll look for some way to get into your soul. And when he does, his purpose is to tear you down. His purpose is to come between you and God. The first time Satan shows up in the Bible, the first thing he said to Eve was, Yea, hath God said, God doth know. And of course, he was bringing God's integrity into question, amen. And this put a, this put a, this put a, a, a barrier between Eve and God. And that's all he has to do. That's all he has to do to any of us. If he can come between you and the Lord, then your fellowship is gone. And when your fellowship is gone, your joy is gone. And when your joy is gone, your power is gone. And when your power is gone, all you're gonna do is drift. And when you start drifting, believe me, you'll drift right back to where you came from right back to the same old place. That's why fellowship is so important. And that's why the integrity of God is so important. Do you trust him? Do you believe in him? Do you know him? Do you know he can't lie? Do you know the Bible tells us plainly if God be for us, who can be against us? Even, even though it looks like everything is coming apart and God doesn't even know you exist. He knows you. And God knows more than I do. And he knows better than I do about what I need. Now, sometimes I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it one bit, but the Almighty makes a choice and either I accept it or I reject it. And if you reject the hand of God beginning to move in your life, then you're gonna push that fellowship away. And when fellowship is gone, as, just, as I just said a moment ago, when fellowship is gone, joy is gone, and the joy of the Lord's your strength. Amen. Amen. And without that, you drift and you just drift and drift and drift and wake up one day and you say to yourself, how did I get here? I got saved from this, what am I doing? I'm right back where I started from. That's right, because that's exactly where Satan wants you to be. He wants you to be where he can beat you to death with what you used to be, because that's one of his greatest lies. He said, you see, you see now, I told you this religious thing was only gonna last a short period of time. You'd get over it. Now you're right back where you started from. Now you might as well enjoy life and do the best you can with what you got here because you only go around one time. So live it with gusto. <laughs> Amen. That's exactly the message of Satan. 
But the Apostle Paul said, if in this life only we had hope in Christ, we would of all men be most miserable. Amen. He said, I'll walk, I'll live and move toward that high calling of Christ Jesus. Not in this life, but in that one to come. Amen. Amen. Now, I know it's one thing to preach it, but it's something else when it becomes the focus of your life. So we have some unknowns. Now, I'm going to cover these quickly, but I want you to see them. You need to see stuff like this because this is the kind of thing that intrigues me. Look at the book of Isaiah, chapter number 26. Isaiah 26 and verse number 14. How many of you still with me? I haven't left you out in left field. You think, where did that crazy preacher come from? Good night, man. What in the world? Where am I? <laughs> Isaiah chapter number 26 and verse number 14. Now look at this. Isaiah 26, 14. They are dead. They shall not live. They are deceased. They shall not rise. Therefore hast thou visited and destroyed them and made all their memory to perish. Who are these? What are we talking about here? Well, the Hebrew word for deceased, they are deceased, is Rephaim. Now, that should have brought up a red flag. That should have immediately got your attention. Rapha, Rephaim. Wait a minute. Aren't they connected with the giants? That's exactly right. They are. Did you know that Goliath had six fingers and six toes? Did you know that? He did. Did you know that David in battle killed a number of, I suppose, brothers and so forth of Goliath? Six fingers, six toes. The Bible talks about people that had double rows of teeth. It talks about, it talks about, it talks about people that just really don't fit in as people. Did you know that Goliath, uh, by most estimates, is about nine feet, nine inches tall? Now that depends on the length of a cubit. A cubit is 18 inches, they say, from the, from the, from the elbow, the tip of the finger, and a span. What's a span? A span is the, different, is the distance between your little finger and your thumb. They say most spans about nine inches. I measured mine this morning. I, you got to do that, folk. Good night. I mean, you got to get with me here now. I guarantee you, you're going to go home. You're going to measure yours too. Mark it down. And I, I measured my span, and believe it or not, it's nine and a half inches. But you see, when I was 17 years old, I could palm a basketball. Yeah. How many of you, how many of you boys ever been able to palm a basketball? Yes, sir. I played basketball. Loved it. And I could palm a basketball. Photograph taken. Here I stand with basketball in each hand. You know, nine and a half inches. But here's the problem. This cubit, this cubit, that's what it's called, from here to here is the average. Because there are other cubits in the Old Testament that are longer. And it's possible that the cubit could have been the cubit of Goliath. I mean, good night, man. What are we talking about here now? You're talking about nine feet, maybe 10 feet, maybe 11 feet. Who knows? Og, king of Bashan, was huge. And where did he come from? He came from the same place the Rephaim come from, came from. Where is that? When the sons of God knew the daughters of men. Amen. They were children to them. They're the, great, uh, they're the great and mighty ones of uh, Greek mythology. And there's a lot to be said about them. In American history, I've said to you many times, the American Indian makes many references to giants here in this country, in this homeland, right here. Red-headed giants, a lot of them were here in America. And they're still around. But anyway, let's get off the giant thing, let you know this. They are real. And I believed it. And I believe the Bible. And if the Bible says it, that's good enough for me. Now, don't you look at this one here. Look at the book of Job, chapter number 30, and verse number 5. We're going to find out how many go home and measure their span. We get home. We're going to see what goes on here now. Amen. <laughs> yes, sir. Job chapter 30 and verse number 5. Now look at this thing. Job 30 verse 5. They were driven from forth from among men. They cried after them as, a fa as, as after a thief to dwell in the cliffs of the valleys, in caves of the earth, and the rocks. Among the bushes they brayed, under the nettles they were gathered together. They were children of fools, yea, children of base men. They were viler than the earth, and now am I their song. Yea, I am their byword. Look at verse 10. They abhor me, they flee far from me, and spare not to spit in my face. 
what started as a human being driven from humanity. That's what he's saying. You remember what happened to Nebuchadnezzar? You remember him? He was the king of the most powerful nation on earth at that time. He was driven from among men, driven into the field, crawled around on all fours like an animal, and ate grass like an ox. Uh, yes, this is the Almighty reminding him. He raises the king up and he puts the king down. So what have we got? We've got, a, uh, we've got unknowns. There's always that element of the unknown. Now I'm going to close it up this morning with this. I want you to think with me now. What do you think is going to happen when the curtain is pulled back and people begin to see these things that I'm preaching about this morning? Amen. What, are you going to, what do you think is going to happen when the strong delusion begins to fall upon man? And I think it's already falling. Uh, I marvel at, at how set in wickedness that men are. When I say men, I say it in a generic term, men and women. It's amazing. Don't you think? Yes, it is. It's almost as if the conscience is gone. Well, this is what it said in the book of Romans chapter 1, because they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind, a dokimos, a dokimos. That's the Greek word. In other words, incapable of discerning right from wrong. Once they're placed in that position, anything goes because the only thing that matters is survival. Amen. Like Satan said to God in the book of Job, skin for skin, all that a man hath will he give for his skin. In other words, for his life. And for the most part, that's true, but not absolutely true. But it certainly applies. So what happens? How do we, as a, temp as a church, Temple Baptist Church, how do we protect ourselves from becoming part of the delusion, part of the fall, part of the problem? How do we do that? Well, there's only one person that should receive our love, our joy, our peace, our hope, our home, our righteousness, our everything. And that is our Lord Jesus Christ. And the only way that we're going to know the true Christ is to know him from the Bible. Preach the Christ of the Bible. Here's what it says in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 23. If I'm going to preach Christ, I'm going to preach this. 1 Corinthians 1, 23. But we preach Christ crucified. Under the Jews a stumbling block, the Greeks foolishness. Preach the crucified Savior. You see, we don't, we're not saved, no one's saved by following his life, emulating his deeds or his act. No, my friend. He went to the cross and tasted death for every man. The cross is a horrible place, but that is the power of God into salvation. Hebrews chapter number 9, verse 15, we have to preach the blood. Amen. Hebrews 9, 15, the blood of Christ. You say, that's a slaughterhouse religion. If you don't have the blood, you have no cleansing from your sin. Call it whatever you want to. For this cause, he's the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Verse 19, Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law. He took the blood of calves and goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people. And he says in verse 22, almost all things are by the law purged with blood and without the shedding of blood is no remission. For verse 24, Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for you. Yet he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others, for then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself, and as it appointed to men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of men and to them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. This is the blood of the new covenant, he said. Now look at this thing in 1 John chapter number 2 and verse number 1. When we preach Christ, we're going to preach this. And this is a big one. They all are. But I want you to call your time. I want you to see something here. 
First John chapter number two and verse number one. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. Now look at this, the righteous. Do you see this? You could say it this way, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. In plain words, he is righteous in his own right, unlike anyone else. He's the righteous one. Our righteousness doesn't count. So you've been good this week. Well, good for you. But what's that going to do with your salvation? You're going to, well, I'll be good. I'll be good. I don't care how good you are. You're incapable. You don't have the ability to cleanse your sin, to make atonement for it, for redemption, propitiation, all these great doctrines. The book of Romans breaks them down. You can't do it. It takes the blood of Christ, the righteous one. Amen. I want you to look this up when you get home and type it in, righteous angels, okay? And let me know what you find. Righteous angels, all right? I'll tell you what you'll find, but you go ahead and, you know, I'm trying to be mean with you. I want you to do something because I know what the result's going to be. Righteous angels. Now, holy angels, oh, yeah, the Bible's full of that. But righteous angels? Well, what do you mean about that? Righteousness has to do with the way you live your life. It has to do with the morality and all of that. It has to do with your nature, your obedience to God. It has to do with your absolute and complete dedication, dependence upon the Lord. That's where righteousness comes from. This is why we fail, because we cannot be absolutely dependent. We cannot be absolutely right. We come short. So the only righteousness that's going to matter is the righteousness of Christ. And then... 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Apostle Paul said, I preach to you the gospel. What's the gospel? Let's look at it. 1 Corinthians 15. Say, well, I hear this all the time. I know you do, but a lot don't. They don't. A lot of them out there, if they're not around a, 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 a pool of water, a river or something, they can't, uh, you know, there's no gospel with them. They, gotta have, they have to have the water. In 1 Corinthians 15, I declare to the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and wherein you stand. Verse 3, I delivered first of all that which I received, how that Christ died for our sins. According to the scriptures, he was buried, and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And then what, what follows is the witness and testimony to support it, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Now I want you to look at this, Philippians 1, 21. Philippians 1, 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I appreciate when people respect the preacher. I do. And respect your Sunday school teachers. You show respect to each other. You love one another. That's, these are all good things. This is the, these are the things that you need to do. But folks, if our attention and our focus in this house is not toward the Lord Jesus Christ, we're going to die and we're going to fail and we're going to come up short. That's the only way in this generation, especially 2024, that we're going to stay on the right track, have the right spirit, and preach the truth. You have to keep your eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as I said in the message, you've got to know which one's the right one. There is a Christ. There is a Messiah. There is a Jesus that is not the true one. The Lord Jesus Christ that went to the cross that saves your soul will lift a burden from your soul and the Holy Ghost will fill you. And once you've felt that power, the Holy Spirit of God leading you and guiding you and directing you in the scriptures, you won't go wrong. The Holy Spirit will not put up with apostasy. And when you start following the wrong Jesus, he'll depart when it comes to the power of God. He'll leave. I'm not saying if you're born again, you'll lose the spirit. No, but there'll be no power. There'll be no unction. There'll be no presence. That only comes with fellowship with God. And the only way you can have fellowship with God is to exalt the true Lord Jesus Christ. I exist because he exists. I gladly take my place at his feet and glorify his holy name. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray you'd use what I've said this morning for the glory of God. If somebody needs to be helped, I pray you'd help them. And Lord, no doubt, there's many in here and many that are watching. They need help. 
It's like a minefield, Lord. It's like a minefield. You take the wrong step in this religious scene in America and you'll get blown all to pieces spiritually. Help us, Lord. Help us get the truth out. Help us keep focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to do that. We have to do that in your holy name. I don't anybody looking, but anybody in your house raise your hand and say, Preacher Lawson, I want, I want to do what you're talking about. I want to keep my mind on Christ and I want to keep it on my mind on the true Christ. God bless you there. And you folks here, well, God bless you. Hands up everywhere. Praise God for that. Amen. Amen. You respect the preacher. We respect each other. But I can't save you, folks. Don't put your eyes on me. Put your eyes on the Lord Jesus. Keep your mind settled on him and not me. I'm just his witness. I'm his testimony. I'm his preacher. But that's as far as I go. He, you need him. You've got to have him. Father, I pray for those who raise their hand now. Bless every one of them. Father, glorify the Son and lift up his holy name. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, let's stand up here this morning. What we got, brother? another verse there, brother. Savior, Savior, Savior. you figured by now Satan is your enemy right. amen. amen and if you can identify him in his presence or in his work or in his people or whatever then you've made you've made the, quite an accomplishment so I, I plead with you today as you leave out of here remember your adversary the devil is a roaring lion he's walking about seeking whom he may devour the scripture says whom resists steadfast in the faith and it all goes on to say knowing the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world he uses what happens to you in life Amen. as a weapon against you, whom resist steadfast in the faith. So that's the only way you can deal with him in the faith. Amen. Amen. All right. God bless you. Let's pray. Yes, sir. Uh, I was all right to hear that. This was hard. He fell off of the porch, you say. All right. All right. Yes. All right. Be meet me this afternoon at 5 o'clock here at Temple for prayer. You can preach too much, sing too much, talk too much, this, that, and this, that, too much, but you'll never pray too much. Amen. Amen. All right. Let's pray. God bless you. Meet again uh, this evening at 6 o'clock for the evening service, and then Wednesday night at 7 for prayer meeting. All right. Yeah, that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, yeah. Good. Good. All right. Oh. Yeah, it's going to be Lord. Okay. All right, Brother Roger Lee, will you dismiss us, please?